know me. Um, I'm an assistant pre professor in the College of Medicine and the College of Science and Health. I've been at Drew University since 1984, developing uh, primary prevention programs in the area of HIV of risk reduction, as well as established the first mobile HIV testing program in LA County back in 1991. So uh, I consider it an honor and a privilege to be here tonight. Um, given that we're dealing with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, I have dealt with the HIV AIDS pandemic for close to 40 years, um, some of the misinformation and uh, conspiracy theories uh, that flooded the community around HIV when it first hit the scene in the late 70s is occurring around COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. So as potential ambassadors who are going to be educating your congregations and other members of the community about COVID-19 uh, primary prevention and mitigation efforts, it's really important that you understand why some individuals in our community uh, have these attitudes of uh, mistrust and conspiracy theory. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Next slide. So um, at the end of this presentation, um, you're gonna be able to explore the history of uh, medical and research mistrust among racial ethnic minority communities. You're gonna be able to discuss em the empirical evidence of medical and research abuses which have contributed to this medical mistrust concerns among racial ethnic minority communities. We're gonna be able to discuss the Institute of Medicine Seminole 2002 report unequal treatment and define structural barriers that contribute to health disparities. Next slide. We're going to, I don't know why the meeting is recorded as blocking my narrative, discuss why mistrust exists among African-Americans, discuss the US public health, the infamous US public health Tuskegee syphilis experiment and the Guatemala STD experiments. And we're going to preview a very short video called Hole in the Head, A Life Revealed, A Radiation Experiment Gone Bad. Next slide. Um, the United States has had a history of uh, experimentation involving racial ethnic minorities. And uh, these ex ex experimentations have occurred throughout American history and especially in the 19th and the 20th century. Uh, Edwin, there's this, there's this image that's covering all of my narrative and I can't read it all. Can you move that? Can you move it up or something? You don't, you don't see it? No, doctor. Oh, it says this machine is being recorded, but it's right in the middle of all of my narrative when I'm talking. Have to hit continue. Oh, you click just on continue, uh, it click on the OK. Way, continue. Hit, hit the continue. continue? Yes. 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 Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> Next slide. Some of these unethical experiments have included exposure of humans to chemical and biological agents experimentation on U.S. prisoners, sterilization experiments on poor, low-income women of color, gynecological surgical experimentations during slavery, experimentations on vulnerable children, as well as human radiation experiments. And we're gonna uh, review this in detail tonight. Next slide. So uh, this slide is focusing on individuals, primarily African-Americans who were exposed to either chemical agents or biological age agents in uh, the 50s in studies that were coordinated by the US government. Uh, and so it talks about 
a studies called the Tracer Studies of the 50s. This happened in Memphis, Tennessee, where two African-American mothers with four-month-old babies, both who were breastfeeding, they were given a total of 200 microcurries of iodine-131. You need to advance it. You went backwards. <laughs> Over the course of you advancing it too fast, go back over the course of two months. And the two women received over 20 times the radiation required to cause the growth of thyroid nodules. The outcome was that both mothers died and both babies died. Uh, another experiment using biological agents was called the Ebcade uh, study where a 55-year-old black truck driver was injected with plutonium, who did not give consent to participate in the study. Nearly five times the amount that was needed to cause bodily harm he received. And uh, again, it was one of the um, individuals who was a part of the study commented that I was disturbed for two reasons. One, the poor man could not possibly have given his consent to be a guinea pig. And two, I was afraid he was selected for this experiment in part because he was black and it was unlikely any of his family would learn of the plutonium injection. Uh, next slide. This, this next slide focuses on an incident that happened in June of 1945 where army doctors exposed patients to malaria carrying mosquitoes in the malaria ward at Stateville Penitentiary in Crest Hill, Illinois. Next slide. And then this, this slide focuses on something closer to home. Um, this happened in the 60s and the 70s uh, at LA County General Hospital where Latina women of childbearing age, when they went in to bear their children, uh, without their consent, they were sterilized by physicians at LA County General Hospital. And some of those women filed a class action suit against the county and they won that lawsuit. Next slide. One of the classic textbooks on medical and research mistrust is Harriet Washington's book called Medical Apartheid, which was written in 2007, where she documented the history of medical experimentation on African-Americans in the US starting in the 18th century. Dr. Washington highlighted three, she highlighted three areas in the book. There were three parts of the book. One focused on the cultural memory of medical experimentation that remained in the community. She discussed recent cases of medical abuses and research. And lastly, she focused on the relationship between racism and medicine. Next slide. In this slide, some of these experiments that took place in the 18th century uh, focused on this doctor who's called the father of modern day OBGYN, Dr. James Marion Sims, who literally experimented on slave women. Um, they, women who would develop these fistulas and he would do surgery on them and perfect the surgery and then uh, use those procedures on Caucasian women and he did this without giving these slave women any type of anesthesia. And at the time, the science uh, was stating that blacks did not experience high level of, of pain as Caucasians did. So they didn't think that people were in pain while they were doing these surgical procedures on them. Next slide. This is another experiment that took place in uh, Waverly, Massachusetts. It's called the seven, 73 Fertinol Boys who were administered high levels of radioactive calcium. 
uh, in a home for quote unquote feeble minded children. And their goal or objective was to assess how the radioactive nutrients were digested and they collected blood, urine and stool samples among these subjects of feeble minded boys. Next slide. This is uh, another radiation experiment that took place in the 50s at the Medical College of Virginia where some poor African-American burn uh, victims were subject to additional burns called beta burns and injections of radioactive phosphorus. The outcome was that there were significant, significantly higher death rates than the burns than the original burns would have caused if they had not been experimented on. Next slide. And this is um, another medical experimentation that took place in a small town in the South where Virtus Hardeman was one of five boys selected to be used in an experiment to gauge the use of radiation on the human cranium. The experiment was misrepresented as a new medical therapy for a scalp fungus called ringworm. And so we're gonna look at this brief three minute video where Virtus actually talks about what happened to him when he was a small child. Can you turn it up a little bit? It's not really my story, it's our story. Because I could not have had it done without you. I met Virtus in the church choir. He really couldn't carry a tune very well. In fact, sometimes I would look to him and I would sing directly in his ear and that way that would get him back on pitch. What was so compelling for me was that here was a man who had never written a book or made a film before because of the love of his friend became a storyteller, became a filmmaker. Any, any memories come to mind? Oh, very fond of memories. Maybe on a Saturday afternoon, if you find somebody had an old broken down wagon, you take the hook on the guard, and hook it, you know, but make Can you wire. turn it up a little more? Oh, that hook down the hill or whatever, that's, that's the only thing. You well, would have to use your volume. That that's our dog. There's a black man that found it. Mm -hmm. Found it. Not, this is amazing. Not a Our station, the black community, played such an integral part in that whole process of freeing slavery. Oh, yeah. They called this little community Freedom Village. We never thought much of the segregation that was normal when we came up. Because that's all we knew. I knew that something was wrong on this particular day. All of a sudden, he began to sob. He was sobbing uncontrollably. And he said to me as a child, five years old, I was experimented on. I was experimented on with radiation. They had a little round beanie they put on our heads, and then two girls stood behind a lead screen, and they pushed a button, and it seemed like I saw some flashes. And she told the other nurse, oh my God, I'm giving him too much. <laughs> Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I think any sort of description of what has occurred and what Virtus lives with on a daily basis is nothing short of incredible. Are you angry? No. But if you're angry, that means your heart's not right. <laughs> It was God's grace that helped me, he kept me here. I think he wanted this to go. Mm -hmm. I think he wanted to go. To show the magnitude of his mess. Because it should be done. Man, 
Thank you, Edwin. So we can continue with the slide presentation. Next slide. Keep going. So many of these medical experiments were performed on children, the sick, and mentally disabled people under the guise of medical treatment. In many of the studies, large numbers of the subjects were poor racial ethnic minorities or prisoners. Funding for many of the experiments were provided by the US government or private foundations. These experiments were usually highly secretive and in many cases, information about them was not released until many years after the studies had been performed. <laughs> Next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about the United States eugenics movement, uh, which was a science-based and social movement of the 19th and 20th century which involved applying principles of genetics and heredity for the purpose of improving the human race. Next slide. The term eugenics was coined by a gentleman named Francis Galton in the late 1800s in England. He advocated for a selective breeding program for human beings in his book, Hereditary Genius, to produce a highly gifted race of men by judicious marriages during several consecutive generations. This eugenics movement in England promoted eugenics through selective breeding for positive traits. However, the eugenics movement in the United States in the early 1900s and 20th century focused on eliminating what they call negative traits. These negative traits or undesirable traits were concentrated in poor, uneducated and minority populations. And because of the eugenics movement, many people who were labeled feeble-minded uh, were sterilized at the turn of the century in this country. Um, research has demonstrated that racial ethnic minority patients tend to receive a lower quality of care than non-minorities, even when they have that same type of health insurance. And, and it's due to that, that in 1999, Congress asked the Institute of Medicine, a very distinguished organization, to investigate racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare delivery. Three years after convening, the Institute of Med uh, Medicine issued their seminal 2002 report, which highlighted the unequal treatment of not only African-Americans, but other racial ethnic minority populations throughout the United States. Next slide. So what are health disparities? I'm sure you've heard that terminology a lot. This report defined health disparities as differences in the quality of care received by minorities and non-minorities who have equal access to care. Health disparities do not have one simple cause. Next slide. African-Americans, in general, have higher morbidity and mortality rates across all disease categories than any other minority group in this country, including disproportionate rates of cancer, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, and hypertension. And these persistent gaps in health or health disparities can be directly linked to social inequality as well as structural and institutionalized racism which are unfortunately entrenched within US institutions. Next slide. The report identified several factors contributing to why health disparities exist in this country. Number one, the manner in which healthcare systems are organized and operate can contribute to health disparities. And they say, for example, healthcare policies or practices to reduce costs may pose barriers to minorities' ability to access care. Number two, language barriers can contribute to health disparities. Many health plans do not offer professional interpretation or translation services to patients that do not speak English. Next slide. Patients' attitudes and behaviors can contribute to health disparities. For example, some minority patients who've had negative or bad experiences within the healthcare system 
do not trust healthcare professionals and therefore may delay seeking medical care until their illness is too far along to effectively treat. And lastly, healthcare providers' biases, stereotyping, prejudices, and uncertainty when treating racial as a minorities can also contribute to health disparities. Next slide. So now we're gonna focus on the infamous US Public Health Service Syph uh, Tuskegee syphilis study, which was operational from 1932 to 1972. So this study um, was, was implemented based upon some prior studies that took place in Eastern Europe in the late 1800s, where uh, they were studying the effects of syphilis on sexually active adults and we're trying to come up with treatments and cures. And so by um, the early 1900s, there was uh, an interest in studying syphilis in an area where it was endemic. And, and in many instances, it was endemic in the black community in the South. So the aim of the US Public Health Tuskegee syphilis study was to record the natural history of syphilis in African-Americans. So actually what they wanted to do is to see what effect syphilis would have on people's health status and what type of damage it would do to your major organ systems. And they wanted to follow these individuals until death. And so after uh, they died, they actually took them over to um, Tuskegee where they did autopsies to, to actually see and document the damage that was done. The study was initiated in 1932 when there was no proven treatments for syphilis. And the study subjects were told by the researchers that they were being treated for quote unquote, bad blood. Next slide. A total of 600 African-American men were enrolled in the study. 399 of them already had tertiary syphilis, meaning that the government did not infect them with syphilis like many people believe, but they already had the tertiary stage or the final stage of syphilis. And these were put into what they call the experimental group. And then another 201 of the participants, they were in the control group and they did not have the disease. Most of the men were poor, illiterate sharecroppers from Macon County, Alabama. Next slide. Incentives to enroll the African American men in the study included free medical exams, free transportation, meals on examination days, free treatment for minor ailments, and burial uh, stipends. And so in Macon County, Alabama, once a year, these researchers would come from up north and there was a nurse, uh, I believe her name was Nurse Rivers, who was well known in the community who helped recruit these men. And so uh, researchers, physicians would come and do their examinations. They, they would go away and then they would come back and uh, follow up these men for over 40 something years. Next slide. When penicillin became the standard treatment for syphilis in 1947, when you could actually be cured, the experiment should have been stopped, but it wasn't. And actually uh, medical treatment was withheld from the participants in this study so that they could continue to uh, you know, do an assessment on the impact that syphilis was having on these men, on these men's lives, even though that they could have treated them and cured them. Of the original 399 men, 28 died of syphilis, 100 died of related complications, and 40 of their wives became infected with syphilis, and 19 of their children were born with congenital syphilis. So this is a study that in some articles around COVID-19, um, mitigation and the promotion of vaccines, you hear people saying, well, I don't wanna be used as a guinea pig. Is this something similar to the Tuskegee syphilis study where they're gonna be experimenting on us? 
So when Harriet Washington talked about this cultural memory of these abuses that have occurred, you can understand why when uh, all of these atrocities have been going on for generation after generation, and especially in the African-American community and other communities of low income, racial ethnic minorities. Next slide. The Tuskegee syphilis study came to an abrupt end in 1972 after a reporter, her name was Jean Heller with the Associate Press, broke the story in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And as a result of the story being pub publicized, um, Senator uh, Ted Kennedy formed a committee where they um, developed standards so that moving forward after 1972, that human subjects would be protected from any kind of abuses when it came to medical and or research experiments involving, again, human subjects. And as a result of that, institutional review boards were established at major academic institutions around the country. And again, one of the key objectives of those institutional review boards is to have uh, a committee of both the researchers and the community in order to ensure that the rights of any human subjects involved in research are protected and people aren't being used as guinea pigs. Next slide. So these are just some photos of the men who were study participants uh, in the study starting in 1932 and ending in 1972. Next slide. This was an article in the New York Times uh, when Jean Heller wrote the story about what had happened. Other pictures of the study participants lining up to be examined by uh, the medical personnel who were involved in the study. Next slide. Um, this is another case that not, people, not many people really know about, but it's, there were similar experiments took place in the late 40s in Guatemala. And it was interesting that uh, a US Public Her Service physician named John Cutler, who was involved in the Tuskegee, Tuskegee syphilis experiment, he went down to Guatemala and with the approval of the Guatemalan government and the US government, he experimented on approximately 1500 study subjects in Guatemala from 1946 to 1948. Next slide. So in the Guatemala STD experiments, uh, the subjects included prisoners, prostitutes, indigenous Native Americans, and mental hospital patients, all vulnerable populations. And in this case, the Guatemalan doctors, along with Dr. Cutler, they actually infected healthy people with gonorrhea, chancroid, and syphilis to determine the effects of penicillin and the prevention and treatment of STDs. Next slide. So, and like summary, given this long-standing history of medical and research abuse in the US, as healthcare professionals, researchers, and community advocates, what can we do to address broad-based community fear, apprehension, and mistrust of the US healthcare system and biomedical research and our researchers by African-Americans and other people of color? So based upon my almost 40 years of doing community outreach in South LA, as well as on a national and international perspective, these are some of the best practices that I would share with you as potential in COVID-19 education and mitigation uh, ambassadors that you, that you uh, think about. Uh, you need to stay educated and informed on the subject matter. And so with workshop, workshops like this, it gives you an opportunity to be educated and informed by experts. You need to immerse yourself in the communities you work in and know your community. You need to develop trustworthy relationships with community residents and community gatekeepers. You, I'm considering you the gatekeepers 
Your word is your bond. So if you say you're going to do something, you need to do it. Next slide. You need to edu educate the community and consumers about the importance of community partner participatory research and the community's essential role in being engaged in this type of research. Ensure that research which is conducted in the community, you need to back up, involves community representatives in all phases of the research from its inception to its conclusion. You want to, the engagement of community members and researchers needs to be bi-directional and the researchers must obtain institutional review board approval to conduct the research and the research findings need to be summarized and reported back to the community when it has concluded. Next slide. You need to have total transparency and accountability when researchers come to the community seeking to implement research projects, and you cannot be afraid to challenge researchers. If as a community member, you don't understand something, you need to ask questions. Like Dr. Bazargan said earlier, there's no such thing as an inappropriate question. And as appropriate, you need to seek ongoing training and personal involvement in any type of community partner participatory research taking place in your community. Because you are the eyes and the ears of the community. The more educated that you are, the more that you can educate and allay fears uh, of misinformation being circulated in the community. Next slide. Given the longstanding history of unethical medical, biomedical, and research experimentation, which has taken place in the US targeting African Americans. I just wanna know from some of you, how do you think the African American community will respond to solicitations to participate in COVID-19 primary prevention, therapeutic and or COVID-19 clinical trials? And even how do you think the community is gonna to respond <clears throat> to participate in COVID-19 vaccine trials? Does anybody wanna comment based upon what you've just reviewed or your own personal experiences within the healthcare system? No one? <laughs> I'd like to respond. Uh, this is Shirley. And I think uh, from the, in the African-American community uh, that it would not go over well. I think we would get a negative response from people wanting to be used for trials. I don't think they, uh, you would get a really good number. And I only say that because of, um, you know, I was misdiagnosed on some several things and um, on medical issues. So it wasn't a trial, it was an actual test and they misread it on more than one occasion. So I would say you would get a negative response from an African American community. Anyone else? Anyone How, how is my time going, uh, Sharon or Edward? You're doing, You're doing great. great I'm, I'm doing okay, doing good, good. good. I totally agree, agree with you. Since COVID uh, hit the United States early last January, there have been numerous uh, newspaper articles around the country about the hesitancy of African-Americans um, either being screened for COVID-19 so that they would know their status and definitely hesitancy about taking the vaccine. And it sort of alarmed me because uh, early on, I went on the radio on the front page and um, as Dominique De Prima was interviewing me, she was uh, sharing all this information that was, uh, being put on the internet and social media and it was a lot of misinformation. And I was, I knew then that if this mis, misinformation got out into our community, that a lot of people's lives are gonna be jeopardized. And so I, I made every effort to try to start uh, mobilizing with other people to get the word out, to dispel some of this misinformation that was circulating on the internet and on social media about COVID-19, about it being a hoax, that it didn't affect African-Americans, um, that, um, that it might be man-made, 
uh, just a lot of mis that that it, it was due to what the 5G network and the radiation coming from these uh, phone towers. So it was a it, it was sort of frightening to think that in our community, which was one of the most vulnerable populations to COVID-19, that because of some of this misinformation, people might not seek the help that they needed to make sure that they would stay alive. And so that this workshop is so so key in that we really need to get the word out to the community that uh, being vaccinated will save lives and knowing your status will also save lives. Next slide. So I, had, I, I wanted to give you a quiz based upon the information was, that was provided and so the first question was in the US, due to longstanding federal institutional review board guidelines, the rights of human subjects have always been protected. So based upon what you just heard from my presentation, would you say that's true, false, or you don't know? False. false. It's false. It's obvious false. it's false because institutional review boards weren't established until not until after 1972. 72. Yeah, second question. In the US public health Tuskegee syphilis experiment, approximately 399 black sharecroppers were infected with syphilis. Is that true, false, or you don't know? True. No, it's false. Remember, it's false. Uh, it's the people bad. who were recruited already had tertiary stage mm -hmm. syphilis. Mm -hmm. It was in the Guatemala STD experiment yes. that yes. people were infected uh, with STDs. Number three, in community partner participatory research, the researchers make all of the decisions concerning the research to be conducted. False. Is that true, false, or you don't know? False. That's false, that's correct. And why is it false? Who, who said that? Can you explain why it's false? It's false because the people, the, if you wanna use the word subjects, are those who choose to participate in they have a say so in it as well. That's correct. That's correct. They're actively involved and there's this bi-directional communication that takes place. Now, number four, the eugenics movement originated in the U.S. in the 19th and 20th century. Is that true, false, or you don't know? That's false because it originally originated in England back in the 18th century, and then it 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 transferred over here in the United States in the earliest 19th and 20th century. And then the last question is: the Atomic Energy Commission was not aware of the numerous radiation experiments which took place in the 50s and 60s on unsuspecting U.S. citizens. Based upon all of those slides, what do you think? Do you think they were aware or not aware? <laughs> Anyone want to guess? Is that true, false, or you don't know? I believe, I would, I believe that some, some were aware and some were not aware. I'm saying that AEC, the commission, the commissioners, are you telling me that the commissioners who set all these guidelines, who also they, they coordinated no, they the experiments, know. you're telling me they were not aware of they, these they radiation were. experiments? I believe they were aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> they were false. So I, uh, she wouldn't have wanted to try it. Yeah, so ne next slide. I think it might be the last slide. It might be the reference slide. Next slide because we're gonna get ready to open it up for questions. Yeah, so this is the end of the presentation. And again, I wanna open it up for questions and answers for, for everyone who's on the call to make a contribution to us understanding this phenomena of why this medical and research mistrust exists still in the United States and especially in the African-American community and why there's, this what they call vaccine hesitancy uh, is an issue and a major concern in our, in our community as well. So we're gonna open it up for some questions. And we have about seven minutes to have this dialogue.
I just want to first commend Dr. Davis <laughs> for her presentation, dynamic presentation. I know, we, I know we're putting it together. Like I said, she has done phenomenal work. Like Dr. Vizarga said, this is the first day in the, in the entire United States. So please feel free to unmute. You know, if you had questions about what's going on in your community, knowing more, especially when it comes to mistrust, this is the expert to ask. So please feel <laughs> free to unmute at this time. Dr. Bazargan, you have any comments? I have or, a question. We have a question from Ms. Go Ms. ahead. Okay, my question is, um, I'm scheduled to take my second Pfizer vaccine on next Friday. So they tell you the second vaccine makes you very sick. So my question is, is that really true? Is it true that I'm going to be very sick. I know I, the reason I got the vaccines are because my co-workers took it first and they, their testimony convinced me. And I looked at a town hall with the NAACP and they also convinced me that I should take the, the vaccine. So my question is, I, I'm going to comment and then I'm going to defer to maybe Dr. Vargas or Dr. Cobb. Um, uh, should, uh, should, uh, uh, Professor Davis, later today, the director of infectious disease of MLK and faculty of UCLA, Dr. Yohani, extensively will talk about this question. Okay, but I was going to share my experience. I just recently got vaccinated with the Moderna. And uh, over three weeks ago at Kedron. And with the first shot, I didn't feel anything. Everybody I knew who took the Moderna with the second shot had some type of side effects, fevers, chills, headaches, not feeling well, having to stay home. I took my second shot this past Monday. Again, I had no side effects whatsoever, none. And I was a little apprehensive. <laughs> about taking the second shot because I thought I might get sick. The only thing, I just have a little bit of swelling around where I got the injection and that is it, but I had no, no symptoms. And I agree with um, Dr. Bazargan. We're gonna have dynamic speakers to come and talk about vaccination throughout the evening and you'll be able to ask questions. But before I wanted to ask Dr. Davis if she'd be willing to share um, strategies to combat mistrust, especially within our communities and within our churches that we can use when talking to individuals? Number one, you, you, need, you need to get uh, what they call popular opinion leaders or gatekeepers, people who know the community, who the community trusts and respect, um, who've worked in the community, and you need to bring them bo on board as allies and educate them, and then they can go out and spread the word. And people tend to trust people who they've worked with, who they know, who they've seen give, giving back to the community uh, without um, any doubt in their mind that whatever they're communi communicating to them that is, is trustworthy. Like in the even in the Latino community, you have these people call promotoras who go door to door in terms of educating and informing the communities. So if, if you could identify someone along that caliber, uh, also medical personnel, people tend to respect physicians, nurses, what have you, because they, they've gotten this special education and training and they're there to serve the public. So if you can get more medical personnel, uh, health professional people, again, who are well known in the community to be a part of a community mobilization and education campaign, uh, public service announcements on the radio, um, coming to churches and making brief presentations. I think that that would have a significant impact on uh, changing people's minds in terms of if they have concerns or apprehensions. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I'm going to take my shot. I mean, I'm ready to take it. I work with 
with students. So I want to be protected. Great. I feel so relieved now that I've had both of these shots. <laughs> Well, this is Reverend Waller, and I too would say I've had both of my shots, and uh, first and second, uh, uh, I've, we feel about the same, no, no complications. So um, I would advise that, uh, and then I think it's individual. It's an individual thing. It depends on that person and, uh, and, and that person's DNA. Uh, but also, Cynthia, I want to commend you for an excellent job, Cynthia Davis. And then, as I said here, I'm mindful of when you came to our church. And yes, then, years ago. <laughs> years ago. Dawes of Hope, and some of our people are still talking about that. Wow. But, and congratulations and all that you do. I know what you do. I followed you all the way out to Chino. Uh, <laughs> No present. So keep up the good work. Thank you. And I just wanted to echo um, Reverend Dr. Waller's words. Um, she's an inspiration to us all. So we will definitely um, provide you with her contact. Um, some, and you'll be able to reach out to her directly to ask any questions and even to partner on some future efforts. Right now, she is leading efforts on a street medicine um, van, a mobile van and team to be able to provide direct um, health care within our community. So it's a wonderful initiative that's currently ongoing. And that's why I said She's the expert we all need in our lives. So <laughs> with that, um, my, many, many thanks, um, Dr. Davis, for this wonderful presentation. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. Okay. And so at this time, we know we try to give everyone stretch for those five minutes, get a nice bottle of water or something. You know, it's dinner time. <laughs> get a snack from your kitchen. And then we'll start back at 6.05. So 6.05, everyone. Thank you. Oh, they told me I can get a snack. So I'm going to get a snack. <laughs> Leave that alone. No. Uh Thank mm -hmm. you. 